This is VOA Africa. Hello, I'm Africa 54 Managing Editor Vincent McCorry in for STG The Award. It's Monday, May the 10th. Welcome to Africa 54. We continue to work remotely because of the COVID-19 pandemic, but what hasn't changed is our commitment to bringing you the latest and the most important news from the African continent and around the world. This is today's Africa 54. We begin in South Africa and the fallout from COVID-19. Having been forced to close their doors for months due to the COVID-19 pandemic, South African cultural institutions like Johannesburg's Apartheid Museum are finding they are too cash strapped to reopen. David Doyle of Reuters has more. Behind a glass door in South Africa's Apartheid Museum sits a life-size portrait of Nelson Mandela. Up to a thousand people a day used to walk past it on their way to a replica of his prison cell on Robben Island. But today the building is layered with dust and shrouded in a silence only broken by the sound of moths colliding with display cases. Joburg's apartheid museum, like other cultural institutions, shut its doors in March 2020. It reopened in January this year, but with visitor numbers remaining low in the health crisis and having sold no tickets in 10 months, it was too cash strapped to operate. The doors closed again in March this year. The museum's manager, Christopher Till. We've unfortunately had to close to the public temporarily and we've had to lay off the staff, which is a very hard thing to do, particularly when there are members of staff here who had worked for 18 to 20 years. I've actually worked on this project for 23 years. Other tourist attractions are suffering a similar fate. They include the Fugard Theatre in Cape Town, the Johannesburg Art Gallery and Mandela's house in the township of Soweto. That's making life harder for guides like Bongani and Glovu. This place was a hive of activity. Today, there's almost, it's almost just dead quiet. In normal times, tourism accounts for more than 8% of gross domestic product and 1.5 million jobs. Some venues, such as the Market Theatre, are open, but to a restricted audience. Caroline Taylor was at a performance on Tuesday. Very essential. they very much a part of your protest history. Uh, they provide a space where all people can and did come together. South Africa's 200 billion rand or 14 billion US dollar loan guarantee scheme aimed to encourage banks to lend on more favorable terms during the crisis. But many distressed companies are reluctant to assume more liabilities as they struggle to keep the lights on. That report by David Doyle of Reuters. The head of Ethiopia's Orthodox Church has said that atrocities amounting to genocide have been committed in Tigray. This were his first comments on the conflict in the region that broke out in November and has killed thousands. Abode Matias, who has been head of the church since 2013, did not say was responsible for this. He spoke in a video message that was posted on Twitter on Friday by an American religious charity worker Dennis Wardley, who heads a U.S.-based church group called Bridge of Hope International, said Abune Matias had asked him to post the video. In the video, he says genocide is being committed now before describing alleged atrocities such as the raping of women and the bombing and other types of destruction of churches. The head of a government task force on Tigray, Redwan Hussein, did not respond to a request for comment about the video on Saturday. Fifteen boats uh, packed with hundreds of migrants landed on the southern Italian island of Lampedusa on Sunday. Officials said they were expecting numbers to increase as the weather improved. More than 1,400 people got off the vessels at the Mediterranean island, one of the main landing points for people trying to get into Europe, according to ANSA News Agency. Migrants' arrivals are resuming alongside good weather, according to Lampedusa's mayor, Toto Mortello. Around 11,000 migrants disembarked on Italy's coasts from the start of 2021 to May the 7th, 
up from 4,105 in the same period last year, according to the Interior Ministry data. Attackers killed six people at a police station in southern Nigeria, according to a police spokesman. This brings the total number of officers killed over the weekend to 12 amid escalating violence nationwide. The attack early on Saturday morning in Akwa Ibom State killed five officers and one of their wives. The killings followed three attacks on Friday night in the southern oil hub of River State, where seven officers were killed. A landslide at an artisanal gold mine has killed at least 15 people in northeastern Guinea, according to the government. The disaster took place on Saturday in remote Seguera province, 800 kilometers from the capital, Conakry. The zone holds some of the West African country's largest gold reserves. In a statement, the government said it had launched an investigation. The artisanal gold mines of Seguera are notoriously dangerous with diggers working in narrow shafts without much protection. Experts say this has already been a busy year for volcanic activity, but now NASA scientists say they may be able to predict eruptions far enough in advance to save lives. Viewers of Russia of Asadi has more. Lava flows down a side of Guatemala's Pacaya volcano. Local relief groups say for now the lava doesn't appear headed for nearby communities, but that could change if it switches direction. University of Alaska researcher Tarsilo Garona is lead author on a report studying satellite data as a means of detecting future volcanic activity. So the key point of this research is that we can, in principle, use this, uh, this science uh, of heat, of the release of heat that we observe at the surface of volcanoes, we can use that information to better anticipate volcanic activity. NASA scientists studied 16 years of radiant heat with instruments on board satellites. They found in the years leading up to an eruption, the radiant surface temperature over much of a volcano would increase by about one degree Celsius. One of our main goals, main tasks, is to monitor volcanoes uh, in real time. Uh, so incorporating this new methodology, that means that we are going to to provide a lot of extra information that we can use to better understand the activity of active volcanoes and to better anticipate uh, these eruptions. Corona says by adding new tools for detection, researchers can predict months or even years before a volcano erupts. So we basically combine all the different methodologies to better understand what's going on in the sun surface and also to provide uh, forecasts uh, of the activity. It's not always, uh, it's not in general straightforward to, to make those forecasts, but um, yes, with new methodologies and uh, incorporating new data sets, we are getting closer to our uh, more robust uh, forecasting of volcanic eruptions. 21 communities surround the erupting Pacaya volcano alone. Every Wednesday in April, devotees make a pilgrimage there to pray at the lava, sprinkling holy water and seeking divine intervention in stopping the flow. Garona says with more robust data gathering, science can warn communities like this one before the next major eruption ever happens. Arash Arabasadi, VOA News. Some U.S. Republican lawmakers and conservative commentators continue to falsely claim that President Joe Biden's climate plan will force Americans to eat far less red meat. White House correspondent Patsy Widokuswara looks at how burgers have become the latest battlefield in the country's culture war. The claim that President Joe Biden wants to ban meat consumption is false and has turned into viral memes. Still, conservatives, including some Republican lawmakers, continue to promote it. The Biden administration has no intention of limiting meat consumption, said Secretary of Agriculture Tom Vilsack. In the political world, games get played and, and issues are injected into the conversation knowing full well that there's not a factual basis for the issue. It started out with a false headline from a British tabloid that Biden's climate plan could limit Americans to one hamburger a month. That's a lot less than the current average of three burgers a week, according to data from the U.S. Agriculture Department. 
The article baselessly tied Biden's proposal to tackle climate change to a 2020 University of Michigan study that says cutting Americans' meat consumption in half would reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 1.6 billion metric tons by 2030, roughly 25 percent of America's yearly output. Martin Heller is one of the authors of the study. That really is a, a total false connection. You know, we, we really didn't make any um, suggestions to a, a particular policy recommendation. And as, as far as I know, um, the Biden administration has not made any reference to our study as well. With a false claim, meat became a symbol of personal freedom against government tyranny, turning burgers into the latest battlefield in America's culture war. I think there's a lot of the American West and ranchers and masculinity that the right wants to associate itself with. And so steak and meat has become one of those things. With increased awareness of the role of food production in climate change, meat consumption may be political. A 2018 Gallup poll shows that 11 percent of liberals say they are vegetarian, compared with 2 percent of conservatives. But there's no danger of the country going meatless anytime soon. According to the U.S. Department of Agriculture, an American eats an average of 37 kilograms of beef per year. However, they are also increasingly turning to plant-based alternatives, now commonly found in restaurants and supermarkets. It is, um just like a burger. Patsy Wida Kuswara, VOA News. The blessing of the bicycles at the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine is a popular tradition in New York City. Last year, it was held virtually due to the pandemic. But this year, the event was back and many returned with the bicycles they relied on to get through a difficult year. Anna Nelson has the story narrated by Anne Rice. Among many unusual New York rituals, this might stand out due to its longevity. For the past 23 years, in early May, hundreds of bikers cycled to the Cathedral Church of St. John the Divine in New York City to have their bicycles blessed. Even pets come along. She just loves to go in Central Park and when, I, when I'm getting ready to get on my bike, she looks at me really anxiously wondering if she's going to go too and is very excited to get on the bike. Glenn Goldstein started this unusual tradition. Not religious himself, Goldstein is an avid biker who got the idea from his mother. Many years ago, my mother sent me a newspaper article about a blessing of the motorcycles at a shrine. And like all good sons, I took that article and threw it away. And many years later, I thought, this is not a bad idea. And so I came here to this wonderful cathedral and said, can I ask you a question? I was very embarrassed. I thought they would not like this, but they were very nice and welcoming. And we've been doing it for 23 years now. This is the 23rd year. As for the purpose of the ceremony, Goldstein says he likes to think this blessing might keep him and many others a little safer. But the church is beautiful and they're very nice to do this and it's a nice thing to do. I think it's just a lovely ceremony. Well, I believe it helps. Amen. You gotta have faith. And you gotta, all the help you can get and uh, you know, it doesn't hurt, that's for sure. As the pandemic worsened, many New Yorkers saw bikes as one of the safest means of transportation in this hard-hit city. Even the church priests admit they haven't taken the subway in more than a year. At a time during this past year when we were all huddled in our homes in abject fear, and I don't know how many of you are actually from the city, but we were all so afraid to go out. And these, these brave people, many of whom are immigrants to this country, many of whom are not documented immigrants to this country, they went out on their bicycles so we would have something to eat when we were all afraid, uh, huddled in our homes. And so the, 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 the people on the bicycles really in many ways made life possible for us during the pandemic. Each year, roughly two bicyclists a day are killed in accidents on U.S. roadways. Bikes painted white often appear as memorials at the sites where bicyclists have been killed. Pedro Lopez, 41, Brooklyn. Thaddeus Tchaikovsky, 61, Brooklyn. Zudi Dasi, 
79, Staten Island. I think the ghost bike, it's, it's a good cautionary tale for all of us, seeing a bike there, and it's also a way to remember that a poor soul, you know, lost his, his or her life um, doing what they liked or even just going about their daily business. I think it's, it's tragic and it's sad, but it's good to have a memorial for people to realize that it is dangerous with cars and bicycles, like sharing the same roads, and for people to be aware, like, how easy it is for cyclists to get injured when you have thousand pound vehicles riding next to them. They come once a year to have their bikes blessed. Then they're off again, ready for another season of pedaling on city streets. For Anna Nelson in New York, Anna Rice, VOA News. We're excited to hear what you think about Africa 54 during the discussion on Facebook. The address is Africa 54. We're also streaming our broadcast live on Facebook. Please watch and share our show with your friends. Also, check out our headlines 24-7 on voaafrica.com. Still to come, the challenges of being a female journalist in Pakistan. We'll be right back. With the COVID-19 pandemic forcing quarantines and lockdowns globally, the world's homeless face a unique set of risks of exposure. In Russia, a forbidden climate means life on the street is tougher than in most places, forcing the homeless and aid groups that help them to adapt to the times and Russian bureaucracy. From St. Petersburg, Charles Minis reports. Throughout the peak of the pandemic, Russia joined the ranks of governments ordering its people to quarantine at home for months on end. But it was never an option available to all. Noslashka, or Night Shelter, is Russia's oldest charity, providing aid to St. Petersburg's homeless population, estimated at some 15,000 by authorities and more than three times that amount by charity organizations. Right away we understood that people who live on the street will have nowhere to isolate. And let's say they have a positive COVID test or symptoms, they'll have nowhere to go. Nowhere to go because many lack the official documentation, such as a passport, necessary to reclaim their lives. Meanwhile, aid groups like Nasleshka found their traditional work, like offering meals and beds, further hampered by pandemic conditions and lockdown rules. At one point, we even started covering the salary of a restaurant chef who had previously prepared food donated from his cafe. And so we kept him on the job so he could prepare food for our care recipients while his restaurant was closed to customers. Andre, who says he was cheated out of his salary after moving to St. Petersburg for work, a common story that complicates the stigma of Russian homelessness as primarily a cause of drug or alcohol abuse. It's not right. You work so hard pouring the cement and then they don't pay you. It was only later that I fell into alcohol out of despair. Andre and others say the economic downturn during the pandemic has left them with few alternatives to scrape out a living and fearing life on the street more than the virus. I looked at vacancies at the employment agency and there's almost nothing. You look at those newspapers advertising jobs and there's only one. These are stories of hard times with few easy solutions, but also of communities coming together. 
Despite growing government suspicion of Russia's NGOs, Nafleshka's ranks of volunteers and donations have swelled during the pandemic. Never in our 30 years of work have so many people given thought to and cared for homeless people as they did in 2020. In difficult moments, people naturally think about those who are worse off than themselves. Now the organization is working to get the city's homeless vaccinated from COVID-19, opening the door to temporary shelter and the wider net of legal, psychological and employment services Nashleshka provides. But it's an achingly slow process. Traditional Russian red tape means many will wait years to get the official government documentation that allows them to not only get the shot, but also puts them on the path towards finding something like home. Charles Maines for VOA News, St. Petersburg, Russia. Female journalists are regularly seen on camera in Pakistan, but the job can bring challenges. Omer Farooq from VOA Peshawar meets two women pushing back the barriers. Bradizan Hamdad narrates the story. When she started out in journalism, Farzana Ali from Pakistan's conservative Dera Ismail Khan district in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa was told women don't belong in the profession. But she pushed back and is now the first female bureau chief of Aj News in Peshawar, the province's capital. In the beginning, I was told, men don't do the kind of things you are doing, or even men don't dare say no to us. Who was I to say no to them? Well, look, I'm not a thing. I am a journalist. And it is my job to convey information to the people. The 20-year news veteran says women were not allowed to cover politics, terrorism, and other big issues. But she stepped up to take on those beats. Now, as bureau chief, a top worry is the safety of her team, especially in districts with extremism and terrorism. If it seems to us that our lives will be in trouble, mine, my reporters, anyone working with me, especially those working in merged districts, then we advise them to report only that news that would not risk their lives. That is why many issues go unreported. Other female journalists say whatever the subject, reporting from the field can be more difficult for female journalists. When I go in the field to report, people harass me, calling me names and staring at me. The way they stare makes you feel uncomfortable. I am sitting here like this, but in the field, I cover myself in a shawl. But in some cases, Ali says being a female journalist actually helps give depth to their reporting, especially on women's issues. You get access to the original stories. If a man goes, he will talk to men only. A male reporter will never tell the negative side of the story about a woman's issues. I, on the other hand, would bring what a woman really has to say. In Pakistan, one challenge exists for all journalists in the country, access to information. It's said that we have freedom of expression in Pakistan. Everyone can say what is on their mind. But I'm not ready to accept that. You don't have access to information. You don't have access to areas. So where is the freedom of expression? And where is the freedom of press? Still, these journalists vow to keep pushing to fully cover the issues that affect their communities. For Omar Farooq in Peshawar, Pakistan, Bejan Hamdad, VOA News. When Hollywood needs an authentic Victorian dress or Edwardian hat for a new movie, costume designers are likely to head to New York City and go straight to vintage collector Helen Yufna. The 72-year-old fashionista has provided clothing for over 1,000 movies, theater productions and fashion shows in the past 45 years. Nina Vishneva has the story, also narrated by Anna Rice. If you want to try it on. <laughs> a treasure trove of vintage clothing includes hats Rachel Brosnahan wore in The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel, the cardigan Tom Hanks sported in The Bridge of Spies, and the nightgown Angelina Jolie had on in the original Sin. More recent garb of note includes clothes lent to costume designers for U.S. vs. Billie Holiday and Marini's Black Bottom, which won an Oscar for Best Costume Design in 2021. You have a camisole, you'd have bloomers, you would have a corset, you would have several layers of petticoats, and then the dress would go over you. Helen Offner is founder of Helen Offner Vintage Clothing, 
the largest private collection of apparel from yesteryear in the US. Tens of thousands of clothing items and accessories span from the Victorian era to the bright neon of 1980s. In 1982, Woody Allen was doing the movie Zelig, and he went into a boutique in Soho looking for 1920s clothing. So they came out to my apartment. I only had one rack. It was in the bedroom of, of me and my boyfriend at the time. And they bought everything I had. Offner started collecting vintage back when she was young. She would save money looking after the neighbor's babies. She started with vintage books, then switched to rings. Then came clothing. She says her love for vintage stems from a lack of family heirlooms. During Second World War, her parents fled Poland and came to Belgium. Most of her family died in concentration camps. I love old things. I just, they speak to me. You know, they have a history. Somebody loved them at one time. I just, I'm not as interested in new fashion. She would find vintage gems and sell them. But the more she hunted down unique pieces, the less she wanted to part with them. That's when she started renting out her precious possessions to costume designers, directors, fashion show organizers. After the filming comes to an end, actors are supposed to return the clothing they used. But sometimes they don't. We, we supplied a lot of things to the Irishman, and two of the things we supplied were for Robert De Niro. It was a pair of pajamas, and I think there's a scene where he's in pajamas all the time, and a robe. But we didn't get it back. Clothing is subject to wear and tear on set. The Titanic crew couldn't guarantee they would be able to return all pieces intact, and Offner decided not to risk it. So I didn't do the movie. And later I found out that they had a lot of ruined items. Broadway, Hollywood, TV studios and fashion shows. Demand is high for Offner's precious collection. For 45 years, Offner has played a critical role in a thousand movies, theater productions and other projects. Her passion for vintage earned her clients four Emmys and an Oscar, as well as a variety of other awards. The pandemic slowed business, which is now picking up again. Offner's pieces are starting to get rented out, slowly and cautiously. For Nina Vishnyova in New York, NRI's Daily News. And that's our show for today. Be sure to watch Africa 54 on our website at voaafrica.com. From all of us here in Washington, thanks for watching.